the Untice, the colonial past to entice attendees and shoppers. Besides being invited to tour the Reproduction Independence Hall, building replete with an exact replica of the Liberty Bell housed on the building's first floor, guests could also visit the colonial era recreations of other famous Philadelphia buildings, including um, Old City Hall, Philosophical Hall, Library Hall, the Betsy Ross House, the Letitia Penn House, and Carpenter Hall. Adding to the colonial appeal of the site was the location of the new shopping center, sitting directly adjacent to Gunning Bedford Jr.'s house, Lombardy Hall, historic home to one of Delaware signers of the U.S. Constitution in 1787. Other early American themed attractions for visitors included hostesses dressed in colonial garb, Surrey rides, and a number of door prizes. Far from just a kitschy marketing gimmick, Emilio Capaldi envisioned Independence Mall as a new Delaware landmark, a destination shopping experience that could immerse visitors in a recreated past and even educate them about Independence Hall and other early American history without having to visit Philadelphia or Colonial Williamsburg. As the mall was being finished in 1965, Capaldi planned ongoing guided tours at the site, replicating the tours popular at several open air museums at the time. A journalist covering the construction of the new mall confidently observed that, quote, when it was completed, it will be a Delaware landmark, end quote. Capaldi himself told reporters that it was his sincere hope that Independence Mall would make such an impression on visitors that it would soon become, quote, part of the lore of Delaware, end quote. Independence Mall is an excellent local example of what we call the early American movement. The early American movement that followed World War II witnessed a proliferation of architectural expressions, channel colonial or early national styles to celebrate American traditions. Though most scholarship about the colonial revival movement has focused on the period between 1876 to about 1940, the revival of early American themes in architecture and the deck arts did not cease with World War II and instead experienced a widespread resurgence and popularization during the 1950s, 60s, and 1970s. While many people associate post-war America with modernist and contemporary design movements, which conscientiously broke away from er such earlier American traditions, the aesthetic fascination with early American history and its designs and icons never truly faded. In fact, it seems to have surged to new heights during the 1960s and 70s as a more popular and more widespread movement among middle-class and working-class Americans. The decades after World War II created a perfect atmosphere for embracing the comfort of traditions and for celebrating the idea of American exceptionalism. The 1950s, besides ushering in an era of rapid suburbanization and its cultural upheavals, witnessed high political tensions during the Cold War and its attendant celebration of American capitalism, democracy, and history. The 1960s experienced unprecedented social turmoil and disorienting social movements, including the counterculture, women's liberation, Black and Chicano civil rights, the first major gay rights protests, and the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, his brother, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. During the following decade in the 1970s, a political and economic malaise took hold in the United States as problematic developments like defeat in Vietnam, the Watergate scandal, and economic stagflation often soured the nation's mood along with ongoing culture wars and heightened concern about American morals and social stability. During these decades of rapid change and social turmoil, Americans frequently turned to their past for a sense of national pride and stability. The awareness of and orientation to the past was most famously expressed and enhanced by the historic preservation movement culminating in the Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and the American bicentennial celebrations of the mid-1970s. In academia, historians began to shift to the new social history, focusing on the past lives of everyday Americans. However, the celebration of American traditions during the 1960s and 70s went far beyond the passing of historic preservation legislation, national celebrations, and academic developments. Expressing itself most powerfully and extensively through consumer-driven activities, including tourism, pop culture, and especially real estate and home goods. 
Americans traveled to historical destination sites like Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, Greenfield Village in Michigan, and Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, and they visited local historical sites in droves. On television, historically themed programs like Bonanza, Gunsmoke, and Little House on the Prairie transported Americans to earlier and presumably simpler times in the nation's history. The early American movement manifested itself most extensively in people's houses and commercialism in the domestic sphere, thus drove the post-war early American design movement through real estate sales, the renovation of old houses, furniture sales, and in the marketing of a large array of new products that reflected historical themes. Capitalizing on this commercial interest in early American design, many designers of new commercial buildings literally followed suit building comfortable and familiar, familiar colonial commercial buildings, often citing these new commercial buildings on the edges of new colonial inspired subdivisions. Oftentimes these new buildings, especially shopping centers, were built by the same developer as the new subdivision, with the commercial buildings reflecting the architectural treatments found in the new housing nearby. Like the, their newly constructed residential counterparts, early American commercial buildings seamlessly blended colonial inspired design, new construction materials, and the conveniences of modern technology. These commercial buildings typically featured only select elements of early American architecture, particu particularly to achieve a desired look, idea, or sentiment. And this resulted in entirely new building forms. While the idea of a colonial inspired shopping mall seems somewhat contradictory, colonial style architecture was actually a common design motif for 20th century roadside buildings. In the early 20th century, newly mobile Americans, especially city dwellers, sought to escape the heat, noise, and dirt of the city by touring pleasant landscapes. For some auto excursionists, the interest in the countryside was enhanced by the presence of historic places along the road. Early efforts to capitalize on history-oriented tourists were created in the 1920s and 1930s, including historic markers programs, colonial sightseeing day trips, and even historic house museums. Additionally, antique mania took hold in the 1920s, and antique collectors discovered that the motor car greatly facilitated their journeys to remote districts for treasure hunting. These seekers of antiquity needed suitable places for dining, refreshment, and lodging. Many of these early travelers dined and stayed in early inns left over from stagecoach days. By the 1920s, several old taverns were brought up to the standards of a discriminating and comfort-loving motoring public. Newly renovated roadside inns provided the genteel traveler an alternative to roadside food stands or diners, which at the time were notoriously masculine and rough. Soon, purpose-built roadside commercial buildings sprung up along the roadways to capture these new motoring tourists. The largest of these colonial-inspired roadside chains of, was, of course, the Howard Johnsons. Historian Lawrence Levine has argued that Americans were, quote, torn between the past and the present. They could only enjoy the freedom of the new morality by surrounding it in the verities of the past, end quote. Similarly, Americans who delighted in the speed and independent mobility of the modern car often pulled into a colonial inn or gas station, which seemed to reassure that while transportation had been revolutionized, the underpinnings of American culture remained the same. This need for reinsurance continued after World War II as well. Scholars have only noted in passing a construction boom of colonial inspired commercial buildings in the post-war period. Art historian William Rhodes has stated that enthusiasm for colonial forms did not end with the rise of modernism in post-war America, pointing to the continued use of colonial cupolas and white trim on gas stations and supermarkets in the 1960s and 70s. This renewed interest in colonial gas stations was not surprising. By the 1960s, quote, a rebellion against modernist roadside architecture had occurred, end quote. Landscape historian J.K. Jackal was the farthest in trying to understand the rebellion against modernist commercial buildings and the newfound interest in colonial designs in the post-war period. He stated that porcelain and plastic gas stations built in the modern style met with disfavor from planning and zoning commissions, in addition to criticism from the general public during the 1960s. As a result, several oil companies began to design gas stations that blended into their new suburban landscapes. 
The Petroleum News stated in 1960, the so-called icebox look is out. While most of the designs of gas stations still use a basic metal building, they mustn't look like metal. Instead, the industry magazine advocated for the use of rustic features like cedar shakes, bricks, and roof overhangs. Many colonial gas stations of the 1960s and 70s were purpose-built, but earlier gas stations could easily be remodeled. While these scholars have pointed to the continued presence of the colonial style architecture well into the post-war period, to date there is no scholarship that defines the overarching architectural design characteristics of this era for commercial buildings. Independence Mall is the most prominently cited and arguably the grandest and best example of an early American commercial building in the entire state. Emilio Capaldi crafted an elaborate and distinct shopping destination with a colonial American feel by reproducing the architecture of historic and iconic Philadelphia buildings arranged in a U-shaped layout to simulate an intimate early American village. Grafting colonial architecture onto a modern shopping center form, Capaldi sought to recreate the feel of the past, warmer, more charming, and with more character than much of the modern commercial architecture in the area. While touting the authenticity of both the building and the experience, though he was in fact creating an, a new type of commercial site that had never existed before. The main design concept employed at Independence Mall was the extensive use of replicas of colonial era architecture from Philadelphia. Though many of the original buildings Capaldi recreated from Philadelphia were freestanding, his careful arrangement of them as an attached building allowed them to be connected through hallways and for individual businesses to occupy more than one building facade. These individual facade segments employ contrasting roof lines and a variety of exterior wall treatments, including brick, stone, clapboard, and board and batten siding, giving the building the appearance of a layered colonial village. While the construction of Independence Mall was perhaps seen as gimmicky by some observers, the impetus behind the construction was far more complex. Capaldi was a first generation Italian American citizen, and for him, love of his country, American history, and colonial architecture were a balm to the stress of everyday life. In an article about Capaldi and the Independence Mall project published in the Philadelphia Inquirer magazine in 1964, he stated, quote, whenever the pressure of a new business threatened to get me down, he said with a laugh, black eyes flashing, I didn't take a tranquilizer, I took a trip to Philadelphia so I could relax and amble through the streets and admire the old homes like when I was a kid, end quote. He stated that on one of his frequent trips to Philadelphia, where he spent hours sketching colonial era buildings, he conceived the idea to replicate Independence Hall as opposed to the new strip malls, which, quote, are springing up everywhere. They leave no impression on you after you leave them, end quote. He's, he went on, quote, they're sort of long gray lines with dits and dots of neon, right? That's why I wanted to build something different, something that adds to the overall appearance of my city, end quote. After he completed Independence Mall, Capaldi planned a second similar replica shopping center, this time in Delaware's state capital, Dover. In fact, Capaldi had hoped to build an Independence Mall in every state across the country. A 1965 newspaper article discussing the construction of the second mall notes, quote, the shopping center would be built online similar to the Independence Mall, end quote. However, the city of Dover did not approve Capaldi's initial vision, stating that the proposed steeple would detract from the charm of the old state house and legislative hall. And you can see in this architectural drawing, it is in fact missing its steeple at the top here. While this, unfortunately, um, Capaldi passed away before the second shopping mall project was completed. While the state of Delaware purchased the building in 1966, it never truly replicated Independence Hall or Capaldi's first colonial inspired shopping center. For Capaldi, his replica was far more than just a landscape of consumption. He envisioned these malls serving as civic centers, each as a place to look into the past with guided tours of the replica buildings and as a source of pride for their respective cities. Overwhelmingly, observers at the time felt that Capaldi was successful in creating an authentic early American replica, and the mall was frequently praised for bringing character, style, and national pride to a commercial corridor. Independence Mall was described as, quote, an authentic colonial 
office and shop area, end quote, and, quote, as an office and shop plaza in an authentic colonial style, end quote, featuring, quote, an authentic reproduction of Independence Hall at its inner end, end quote. Even a Winterthur Museum employee, an art historian, John D. Morse, heaped praise on Capaldi's effort, noting at first he was, quote, bound to look askance, end quote, at the project due to the replication of Independence Hall, but went on to state that after visiting the mall, to his surprise, he, quote, enjoyed what he saw. He stated that the mall offered color, form, texture, the sound of music, and people's voices, not found at other shopping malls in the area. And for him, this amounted to what he called an aesthetic experience and at a shopping mall. Morse concluded his article by stating that he far preferred the good reproduction of a past architectural style over the modern architecture of so many other contemporary shopping malls. While Independence Mall is the most prominent example of an early American shopping center in the state, they were somewhat common, at least within Newcastle County. Often constructed on the edges of new subdivisions, these early American shopping centers shared a variety of architectural characteristics, including the use of brick or stone veneers, white trim, cupolas, shutters, and even a variety of facade treatments imitating historic villages that developed over a period of time. Independence Mall joined in with and arguably influenced this mid-century design trend here in Newcastle County. The earliest known example of, Amer of an early American shopping center in Newcastle County is actually the Fairfax Shopping Center, built in 1950 and also located on the Concord Pike in Brandywine 100, just about one half mile north of Independence Mall. Conceived by William Wilmington developer Alfred J. Valone, the project was developed in conjunction with and intended to be a suburban center of commerce for the Fairfax subdivision of colonial inspired homes developed just to the east. An article published in the Wilmington Morning News announced the near completion of the shopping center and describes it as, quote, conforming to the colonial Williamsburg type of architecture, end quote, further declaring it a shopping center the likes of which is seldom found in this part of the country. In fact, Valone had gone to great lengths in planning the shopping center, reportedly having researched extensively shopping centers along the eastern seaboard in order to create, quote, a truly real example of an authentic colonial architecture on the Williamsburg plan. As a forerunner to Independence Mall, the Fairfax shops, as they were often advertised, also capitalized on the regional suburban traffic along the heavily traveled Concord Pike Corridor, serving the commercial needs of the rapidly developing post-war suburbs in North Wilmington and beyond. Created in the mid-1960s on the heels of Independence Mall, Possum Park Mall in Newark, which was later renamed Liberty Plaza, is also designed with a colonial village aesthetic, though it is smaller in scale. Um, the original complex is arranged in two linear sections, forming an L shape with the portion facing the road, boosting the more village-like look. Six architecturally diverse segments form the village and feature varied roof lines, including side gable, false front, and side gambrel roofs, and unique storefronts for an overall layered look. A decade later, the creation of Independence, after the creation of Independence Mall, brothers Joseph and Mario Capano developed Peddler's Village, a smaller but similarly Williamsburg-inspired colonial office and shopping center. Located within the actual colonial crossroads of Christiana, the Capano suggested that the design of their concept complex would in fact complement historical interest in the Christiana area. In the mid to late 1970s, Powder Mill Square opened in Greenville and in name pays homage to the nearby Eleutherian Mills and Powder Yard and historic gunpowder gun manufacturing dating to the early 19th century. The shopping center and business complex takes on a similar colonial village aesthetic akin to Independence Mall, but on a smaller scale and with somewhat less elaborate architectural flair. Even after America's bicentennial and the height in popularity, early American design, colonial inspired, inspired commercial architecture continued to appear on the landscape. One example is People's Plaza, a shopping center located in Glasgow, and it illustrates its continued application in commercial design. The earliest and original portions of the complex constructed were, were constructed in the mid to late 1980s. 
So while strip malls and shopping centers are not necessarily evocative cultural resources for most people, they have an almost ever present permanence on our landscape. They represent many important historical trends of the post-war period, suburbanization, car culture, and consumerization. These buildings were created in response to changing social and settlement patterns, and at the time they were constructed, they were a unique and new resource type that are still constructed today. But beyond the shopping mall's importance to the development history of the United States, Independence Mall is also emblematic of more than just that. Emilio Capaldi viewed Independence Mall as a spectacular monument to the American past, a stylish place for commerce in the present, and for Delawareans as a community focal point for the future. Okay, thank you. And I'll apologize, 7 p.m. is not my best, my best starting time. Oh, you must be out of breath. That was great. Thank you so much, Kate. So I'd love to hear what Rosanna and others uh, from the family think. And, uh, and just, I'm sure Kate wouldn't mind taking some questions. I see John has his hand up too. So I don't know, Rosanna, you wanna, to can I put you on the spot first? <laughs> but you're muted though. Still can't hear you. Okay, here we there, go. There you uh, go. I love to hear the. I, I, I'm, I'm like blown away. Sorry, because <laughs> I lived it, and I'm still living it. That's the hard part. <laughs> you know, trying to preserve it. I'm, I'm. There was so much pride by my father in this project because he was an immigrant, had nothing, and, uh, you know, you talk about. You started the evening off talking about Gibraltar and. Uh, my father, and doing a little bit of the reading just yesterday and today, his dream was to actually buy these properties uh, and develop. So like uh, in North Wilmington, there's a Culver village, a colonial village. Where it was built around the Culver estate. He tried to buy uh, Rockwood at one point, um, uh, Brian, so Ryan Grover. So he wanted to preserve these buildings. If what had to happen was there, if there had to be residential around it, at least he could preserve the architectural integrity of, of the, the mansion or the historical building. That's why I'm wondering, why did dad buy, buy this property next to a frigging cemetery? And it well, was- Well, Barney Hall is there though. Yes, I mean, that was the point. And yeah. he died, like he was, his plan was to really cultivate that. And apparently he died and, you know, the estate sold it off. But, you know, that was his dream to be associated with the heritage of America. So, I mean, he, he must have been so in love with it. I mean, he developed homes all over Wilmington and Delaware that were colonial, that really had an aesthetic to them. Every house was different. Every house had to have woods. Every house was, you know, like he really loved to develop that kind of um, uh, architecture. And, and that reminiscence of, you know, uh, immigrants and coming here to be America. It's okay. So, so you had, you had, didn't have a chance to hear Kate's talk before? No, I never heard it. No, <laughs> yeah, because, you awesome. know, COVID. So yeah. it was, uh, you know, we kind of met and she's discovering things about our heritage, my heritage and, the, and Delaware's heritage. I never knew because these things were lost and I didn't have access to them. Um, and there's always, you know, coming into, you know, some Im immigrant families don't want to remember uh, who they are, what they, they try to just assimilate, you know, and be, you know, I hate to say it, kind of white America, like just not remember and, and just like, not remember that we're Italians, and that we have this artistic thing to build. And, you know, I come from a family of stonemasons, you know, we have our hands in dirt, and that's really what we love. And we're carpenters. And, and painters and, you know, we want to build America. And I think that's what my father wanted to do, but with a heritage, with a historical uh, feeling about it. It wasn't about his ego. He wanted to replicate what our forefathers did. Our forefathers, you know, who are our forefathers, you know, if you think about it, but he wanted to be part of Americana. Yeah, and I'll say that um, Rosanna has had a chance to read our much longer National Register nomination, and we have a lot more information about um, her dad and even this, the subdivisions he built in Northern Wilmington, which could also be another subject for a Brandywine Historical Society <laughs> meeting. Um, but I, I, I wanted to focus on the commercial commercial um, building he built. Well, we'll really definitely have you back. Thing. 
Dee, I know you are like the, the captain of this. And, um, you know, you wonder, I wonder why I stay here. And there are so many footprints here. There are so much families that have brought their children up. I mean, we go to the meetings that you chair and it's like, well, yeah, I remember when I was 10 years old, I drove my buck up Conquer Pike. I mean, what is it about this area that we stay and, and we feel integrated and we feel responsibility for it? And you doing this is really important because this really is an essential part of the growth of Wilmington and uh, 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 industrious here and, you know, the DuPonts. And we have a lot to, to, to recognize here and not forget. Absolutely. And it can be 20th century architecture. It doesn't need to just be 18th century. I agree. I mean, when I, in modern 20, this century, I mean, it's great. But I think not remembering is important because we're not so transient here. We're not, you know, so urban, you know, that, uh, you know, people don't have roots here for three or four families. I mean, I'm amazed at the, the you know, Carson and people that have lived here for, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 years. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people I went to school with in, in, you know, right up the street are, are here raising kids, grandkids, you know, they're still here. So um, it's, I don't know what, I don't know what it is, but I guess it's just that it's home to all of us that grew up here and, and, and it's a, not a bad place to grow up. Right. So not a bad area. So um, uh, Jean, you've had patiently been waiting with your hand up. Feel free to un unmute and chime in. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Kate. How you doing? Hi, Jean. Um, I have um, one quick, easy question, and then one that might also be for Roseanne as well as you. Um, the easy one is, I noticed in your presentation, you referenced Delaware Historical Society for the architectural drawings. Have Do you know if they've been digitized? So um, the 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 drawings for the Dover Independence Mall are at DHS and the family actually has the Independence Mall um, on Conquer Pike drawings, which we were able to digitize as part of this project. The, the ones at DHS are not digitized, but as part of our National Register nomination process, the state was able to like to persuade uh, an archivist to take some just pictures for us. So the, the collection hasn't been drawn or digitized. There isn't even a finding aid. Um, unfortunately, it's part of a lot of other architectural drawings and, and somehow they were able to track down that the, the Dover plans were there. So not Never digitized. Okay. I understand how Never that goes. Never saw that drawing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the next one would be, you were mentioned, there was a plan beyond Dover to go to other states. I didn't realize that. So to me, the most obvious one would be Pennsylvania. Did anything happen there? Did it get very far? Roseanne, do you know? I know my father, I mean, somehow, and I, you know, we have an exact replica of the Liberty Bell. So my father somehow convinced the Historical Society of Philadelphia to have a founder or bell maker or whatever, go up and cast the original one. And there's a little history about that where they carved the crack uh, with a, um, a nutcracker or like whatever. It's like, I don't know, they just sliced it. But anyway, he, he had this casting done because he wanted to replicate this bell all over the country. He, he died. I mean, I think Dover was a big blow to him because he had so he was so happy to go to the Capitol. He was going to build this thing. And they're like, no, you can't have a tower bigger than our tower. I mean, it got into this, like, you know, my tower is bigger than your tower. And uh, we never, he never got any further. There were only three bells in the country, from what I understand, from the founder, who's now out of business. Uh, and one was at the Oregon, Carson, you can remember this. The, uh, it was in the Oregon State Building. And when they were in the 60s or 70s, when they were having all the, um, you know, protests, they tried to blow up the building and they put the uh, be the dynamite under the bell and it actually saved the building. So it actually just crashed through the floor. So, I mean, there are only like two or three bells of, of this exact size of the Liberty Bell, which is pretty cool. It's 2000 pounds of bronze. And I have it just polished it up and I'm having it stored right now. I'd like to put it in actually the middle of the mall. I'm trying to figure out how to enclose it so the public could see it. Okay. Cause I think it's cool. Thanks. Well, and it's a it's it's a direct replica of the of the of the Liberty Bell. 
Yeah. So it, it it's it's scaled directly from the from the Liberty Bell. Yeah, and you probably that probably would never happen nowadays, right? To have no, you no, you wouldn't be able to have access to the Liberty Bell now. No. So no. so there are reproductions that were given to all fifty all the states uh, of the Liberty Bell, but they're a smaller size than the original. So right. if you go to Dover on the green. There, it's out on on the green in front of the uh, state house, but it's it's somewhat smaller. Can I say something? Harry, you have a question? No, I have a comment. Uh, comment. It's it fine. Was next door to Lombardy Hall, which of course is a very historic place for the Masons and Cunning Bedford and all sorts of famous Delaware names, but the cemetery was a holy mess for years and years. It wasn't trimmed. The gravestones were falling down, and it took about five years before somebody finally cleaned it up, and it's now a pretty nice place. Right, I agree. I mean, I I'm uh, you know it's owned by the Masons now, um, so uh, I I try to encourage it because it is an historical site. And, you know, I do all I can, but I have no control over that. So I, I agree with you. I wish it was more obvious to the heritage that we're sitting next to someone who actually signed the Constitution. I mean, to me, that's a fabulous heritage that we have here. And it's uh, they kind of keep it secret over there. So. so so the Masons have stepped up their 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 um, vigilance on that property. They've they've in the past two years since I've been there, they've been a little more vigilant of taking care of the property, and, and you can see a difference. There's definitely a a, a difference. It, it it looks much more. It, it it's it's pretty it's pretty nice now. Yeah. And they're responsible for the cemetery as well. It's all all one parcel or. I'm not sure. Someone else. I'm not sure. I, I, so I, I've dealt with a couple of people from the the Freemasons, and and they're really big on the groundskeeping. I don't know about the the you know building maintenance on the Gunning Bedford House, but they are they have been much more vigilant on the property, you know the the surrounding areas, and they've they they really have stepped it up. It, it, it looks much nicer. It's a shame James James Hamby was on our call last month, but he's not here tonight. I know he's involved there, so it's a shame he's not here tonight to answer that question. But. Yeah, that'd be great. They they're yeah. required, I think, once a year to open it to the public, and they do have mm -hmm. masons that you know take a tour and whatever. But I think it's just such a wonderful thing that we have here, and yeah. um, um you know, you know, but the, you know, the, I'd like to see more development there, more care. I've offered, I've done some weeding there, I've done some excavation there, so there's more visible, but there's only so much I can do because I, do, I don't have any proprietary um, input there. Hmm. Hmm. I'd like to step in and, and say thank you to Catherine because this was a eye-opening presentation in a lot of ways, and I've uh, been married to Rosanna for 31 something years and uh but i'm a transplant thanks but i'm a <laughs> transplant to this area so uh didn't you know didn't know a lot of the history and a lot of the connections and uh and and it was wonderful the way you tied it in and of course the the compliment to emilio capaldi is the way others tried to take uh components of what he did and and make something work with it um and then as we come back to the footage and see it's really the grand dom of the of the colonial expression of the shopping centers and um i think that's portrayed and of course uh, the efforts of rosanna and joey and carson who have been working on the property for the last you know certainly diligently for for about 15 22 years, years. <laughs> right but but really in charge and making things happen with the lampposts and the sidewalks and the renovations and the windows and the lighting and all of the things that have kept the property modern while at the same time respecting its heritage. And, um, you know, I'm proud to, to have my business here and to be able to work here every day. And I think it's uh, it's great when people, you know, when, when, when you say Independence Mall and they immediately know where it is. 
Um, I had the opportunity to share a, a fun story uh, of working in Joey's position uh, as a property manager for a few years, assisting with that. And um, I remember walking out onto the uh, parking lot to ask a busload of tourists that had unloaded and were taking pictures of the shopping center um, and uh, to, to, you know, to greet them and see what was going on. And the comment back to me was, it's such a shame that they turn these beautiful old colonial homes into a shopping center. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and I always thought, well, I guess that was the point. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they, they thought it was the other way around, but it was the, uh, the appreciation and the, the, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for, I'm missing it right now, but the, you know, the, the idea that Emilio Capaldi put out there to honor that architecture. And, um, you know, that, that was kind of always one of those fun, fun moments here. So thank you again, Catherine. Yeah, and obviously, thank you guys for allowing me to do research. And it's it's one of those sites that I probably could have talked about for two hours. But one of the things we found in our research is that there were 37 Independence Hall replicas across the country. And this was the only one that ever was a shopping center. And so there are a lot of other kind of especially academic institutions that replicated it. But this is the only shopping center in America. So it's a very special, a special place. Thank you. We're trying. We're trying to keep it, you know, upscale and, you know, character. So, you know, it's easy just to put in plate glass and neon lights and box signs. And, you know, I go out of my way to find artisans that can carve things and goosenecks. And, you know, I'm known as a light bulb queen because, you know, I'm all about, you know, no neon lights. It's like, you've got to have this certain color light and this has to be like 50 different kinds of them and you know different different you know it's it's a it's a lot of people don't realize how intricate those systems are to keep it more uh personal and more intimate but you were amazing that's amazing hmm? you were glowing in a warm blue from luna yes it's my dog it's like it's my tall caller but anyway yes <laughs> well, that's, where, that's where carson comes in because he's the king of light bulbs yes <laughs> he yeah he's amazing i mean i get a lot of comments about uh my signage how you know how beautiful the signage is yeah yeah well you have to keep character uh you know they're hand carved gilded gold gilded signs my eagle i love your eagle well yeah it fell apart i had charles parks a little bit of history here the famous sculptor actually took it to a studio and remade that eagle for me as a friend and i had my sign sign guy's daughter gilded it for me and for a long time no damn pigeon would land on it so i'd have no pigeon you know dung on it but now <laughs> Now the hawks are, are up there, you know, picking on the pigeons, you know, so it's an amazing bird bird festival up there. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a really, I'm really proud of the center. I really am. And, and the tenants are great. I have a tenant there since 1964. How does that happen? <laughs> and we have yeah. the best, the best wine store and restaurant in town there too. Yep. Yep. I'm working <laughs> on it. I'm working on more. Joanne's on here yeah, we have a lot of great, you know, uh, people there. I mean, I'm really proud of it. But, you know, Takumi has been there. Yutagi was there in the 80s. Uh, Melanie yeah. Ponce is in the 90s. I mean, they're, they're and the store, the, the hair salons have been turned over, turned over, turned over. We have a, we have a, it's a family. It's really is, is heritage in itself in the vendors there. I mean, yeah. we're, we're a mom and pop. We're, we're, we're entrepreneurial. We're, we're, you know, people just living their dreams. So that's that's kind of cool because that's that's being lost. All right, Ryan. Right. Oh, sorry. One of you with your hand up. Jay here, yeah. you want to go? Uh, yeah, very quickly. Uh, it was a very sad day at this house when Flavor of Britain left. <laughs> I we loved that tea room <laughs> and the Janet and Chris day. We wish we could get them back. Um, I am the. Uh, retired director of the Convention and Visitor Bureau, and I don't remember ever seeing a flyer about the Independence Mall, uh, some kind of a trifold or something that could be uh, given away. Does that exist? Um, you could ask my husband who has a master's degree in marketing that he could do this for us. 
Well, it's well I would I would say maybe it doesn't yet, but it will because yes. once Thank Kate you. once Kate uh, gets it officially on the national register, I think we should also ask for a state marker, and um, you know get it get it uh, on, on listed on various websites as the national register property and that sort of thing. So hopefully it'll become more people will become more aware of the history behind it, um, uh, you know, as we all are tonight. I think, I think the question was more of historical and there probably were oh, like from the was... when it was built you mean jay harry is that what you meant where'd you go there is because today the the information's on the website of course yeah as some of the information that's been presented here tonight would be perfect for a um, eight and a half by eleven trifold uh front and back a uh, very nice publication, and if if you do get this uh, look, uh, listed on the register, that should really be an incentive for that happening, and it wouldn't be all that expensive either. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for your interest. That's amazing. Thank you. Ryan? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, Rosanna, I had a question for you. And um, Kate, I had a question for you as well. Um, Rosanna, um, I really, um, I'm fascinated by the stories that you have about the little individual choices that you had to make in order to be able to preserve your father's vision. Um, and obviously, like so many preservation efforts, you have to make, you know, you have to make choices about what that's going to be. And like, you have to make um, you have to modernize in so many different ways. And I feel like a lot of people that are interested in preservation, it, um, uh, myself included, like we know a lot about how to do this for houses, but how do you think that differs when you're having to deal with uh, preserving the very unique aesthetic of a commercial property? Great question. It's a marriage. So, you know, I'm not meant for everyone and not everyone's meant for me. So. Um, you know, when, it, when a commercial or a tenant that comes in that wants something, they either get it or they don't. I mean, if they're looking for a neon sign or something on 202 that's flashing or a big, you know, window or, you know, if they, if they don't get the aesthetic that I offer, then, um, then they're not my customer and I'm not their landlord. So what, what really people come to me and they're attracted to is, I want to start a business or I have a business. How do we fit together? And because I have a degree in art, I'm a, I have a fine arts and painting. I, and I've traveled. I lived in, in Europe. I, I study architecture. I'm very every day in my nose and in, in anything design. I, I should have been like an interior designer. Um, I help everyone that comes in there who wants it, how to redesign or make uh, a concept or uh, envision their their vision. So I'm able to present to them, okay, you want this, you want that. What do you want to say? So it's kind of like that. So it's always like this compromise. But mm. everyone that's come in lately has been so cool about, wow, what a great idea. I didn't know that I could do this. I didn't know I could feel like this. Or it, my business could be like, like snuff is, snuff mill is like my vision. The, the swig store was like, we should feel old European. Like people in there, you know, they want, they want to create something that feels like it belongs in the mall. So I'm lucky to do that. And I don't go after, I don't think, well, yeah, I, I, you could be a tenant here. You're not going to have a neon sign. It's not going to work. So thank you. Awesome. And Kate, um, I wonder if the, if the problem that, um, that Rosanna's father might have experienced, or well, I'm sure one of many problems that he probably experienced trying to develop in Dover um, obviously the height restrictions, I mean, I think that every state capital has that issue with height restrictions um, with in relation to the, the, the height of their own capital buildings. But, um, but even more so than that, Dover's actual campus, like their, the, the, the campus of their capital, even though it was developed in the 20th century, is really kind of, um, it's, it's somewhat unique in that it has that sort of campus um, environment of several buildings around that sort of central park space. And it, it, um, and Rosanna, your father's designs mirror that concept in so many ways. I mean, it's almost sort of patterned after um, uh, that, that sort of co colonial concept of that, um, 
uh, that bilateral, bilaterally symmetrical sort of uh, positioning of these buildings around this, um, this, this open park space, or in your case, open parking space. So I wonder if, I wonder if the Dover, the folks in Dover thought it was a little too close to home, a little too reminiscent of what was already, um, already present. Well, yeah, yeah. You're I yeah, <laughs> hit it. she hit the nail on that. And that that was a very, very heartbreaking time for my dad. Because he didn't think he didn't think that he was competing with them. He just wanted to offer this. And they felt that it, it was almost contemptual. Mm. And so what mall did end up in Dover? And where was the location? Sorry, if you don't mind me asking. Did I? Sorry, if you covered that, Kate. I didn't cover it. I can I don't know off the top of my head. It it. Uh, we, I can look it up. Um, it, it was definitely away from the historic downtown, I feel like adjacent to Route 13. Like, yeah, out there, um, somewhere, yeah. Out there. And it was recently demolished, I think, in the last 20 years. And basically, what I understand of it, and maybe Rosanna has a better understanding, is they only build a portion of it. And it never really looked like that Independence Mall. We all know it was never that big. I think they built the center portion and, and nothing really replicated the, the facades. And you definitely hit the nail on the head that they felt it was probably too close to home at that time and one of the headlines at the time when they they turned down the original design plan said like three steeples is too many and they just really <laughs> didn't want anything to detract from the colonial or that colonial revival like um legislative campus um but we have the exact location in the nomination but it, it was definitely not in the historic core so it was out, outside of the city on the commercial corridor but we've never been able to find actual photos of it after it was built or even as it was turned into like a state because the state bought it like a, a building. We haven't seen it really <laughs> besides the plans and then some aerial images. No one was able to find any images of the building. I don't think he really built it anything there. Yeah, I think it was just like a really small piece of the building got built. Um, and then the state bought what was there and used it, I think, as offices for a couple decades and took it down. Thank you both. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan. Are you kidding me? Thank you. <laughs> John, but, you know, I'm talking sorry. about, um, you know, building something around something. Uh, if you look at Old Colonial Village and there's the Culver Estate, and what my dad did was prever pre preserve that old house, the Culver House. I don't know the history, but it's all off of Damon's Road, off of Damon's and Falk. And what he did, which was very curious and in and, and tune with what he did at the mall, he built a he built townhouses around it. So they were really apartments. And this is in the early 60s. And each townhouse, which was then an apartment, had its own entrance, had its own fireplace, had its own sunroom, had its own washer and dryer. And every facade was different. And it was so it looked like a village. Otherwise, that house would have been torn down and it would have been another development. And behind it was Northminster. So very well, he could have just, he developed Northminster. So he could have easily torn that down and just built 10, 15 homes. But he created this ambiance with this, this much like, I don't know enough Gibraltar because the thought of anything happening in that place breaks my heart. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes there has to be a really well-developed, thought-out plan to preserve these, these homes and support them. So... By the way, yes. Rosanna, you're definitely going to have to come over and tell me um, how your dad almost bought Rockwood. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm dying I, I, I that thinking, that's a session unto itself, too, probably. Kathy, that's if awesome. you can find any uh, history on that, because I know that happened. And actually, um, I think whoever, there was uh, some kind of uh, group that, that fought it, which was fine. I mean, it wasn't about my dad making a lot of money. It was like, don't tear this, because I think maybe it was in disrepair at that point. And I think maybe that encouraged it to be saved. Awesome. John, did you have a question? Um, yes, and thank you so much for this very wonderful work to see something that's to be celebrated and celebrating the life of Emilio and the center and keeping it up for these years after. There's, there's a lot of love and things to be proud of here. Um, I was also here, pleased to hear Dee make reference to putting up the sign, and I know she's well connected with historic signs, so that's that's great. I was curious how the, what the process is for getting a property on the historic register. Um, somebody has to be the driver of that and say yes, and get other people to say yes. So I was interested in 
maybe Kate, does somebody describe how that works? Yeah. Awesome so, question. Yeah. Yeah. So we were fortunate enough at uh, the Center for Historic Architecture and Design to to partner a lot with Newcastle County, and so uh, honestly, I I moved to Delaware. I think. 14 years ago now. And it's, it's always been one of my favorite places in the state because I think it's just so, it's so great, right? Like the first time I drove by it, I was like, oh my God, what was that? So it's been on my list of research topics for a while. And our preservation planner here in Newcastle County, Betsy Hatch, when we approached her about doing a national register nomination for that, absolutely loved the idea. So we got buy-in from the county, research the property. This process can take a really long time. I see that Ann Daly's here from um, Newark Union Church and Cemetery, so she can also probably attest to the length of getting something listed because that was that was a nomination also done by the center. Um, so we've been working on the nomination for about maybe two years. COVID kind of slowed us down as I'm sure everyone did. And then after we you draft it, you send it to the State Historic Preservation Office. They have a National Register um, reviewer. Her name's Madeline Dunn. She'll provide feedback. And so we've gotten initial feedback from the state. Um, we were definitely really excited about this property. They have suggested kind of trimming the 70 page single space document back a little bit. Um, <laughs> but that's always so hard to do when you really love what you're doing. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're making final edits. It'll go back to them. And so after it goes back for a final review, the official kind of chain of approval starts here in Newcastle County. We have a historic review board that approves national register nominations among other things. So it'll go to the national register or it'll go to the Newcastle County historic review board. And if they approve it, then it'll go to the state historic review board. And then if that board approves it, it goes on to the Nash it goes on to the National Park Service down in DC and then it's kind of like a 45 day period for them to review it accept it or I guess reject it which we've been fortunate to never have experienced that so it's kind of a long process but um, once it goes through a final round of edit it'll start this kind of <laughs> ascent up the approval chain starting here in Newcastle County first I'm assuming that the owner of the property has to want this to happen Yes. And we did approach Rosanna really early on and kind of told her all about it. And the National Register is just an honor honorary listing. Um, so for anybody who's thinking of listing a uh, property on the National Register, it doesn't come with any kind of protections or restrictions, which I think is especially important in a commercial property like Independence Mall. She's not prohibited from making changes in the future. And as we tell people who are like on the fence, you can take it down the day it's listed. There's nothing to stop it. Um, unfortunately, it would it would be great if it had more protections. But um, so yeah, we got Rosanna um, on board really early on, and her and Joe and Carson were able to provide us some great photos, some great historical um, information about it as we we started to research and write. Well, I keep I could... finding more. <laughs> I just found slides, um, and I have to show you of of it before it was just graded dirt that my father documented. I mean, there's so much stuff now that I'm tuned to it. Like, what the hell? It's just popping up. Like my father's sending me stuff. Oh, that's cool. You'll have to send us some, some of yeah, it. I've just really focused on just get this whole package together. I think it's so cool. And you're not even from Delaware. And neither is Michael. I mean, I'm so honored that you come here because we're like Delaware, you know, and it's like, and you, and you see these gems and it's like, it's the amount of work you put into this. It's amazing. Yeah, and if you're archaeologist. I mean, D, it's amazing, and you too. <laughs> well, I don't have my background is not like Kate's. I'm not a trained historian or anything. I was just going to add to John's question and Kate's answer that I think a couple things. It's it is really key for everyone to understand that the National Register is really symbolic and that any restrictions that people are familiar with that come with historic properties are at least in Newcastle County at the it's part of county land use code. So when you put a historic overlay district on a property. So those are two totally separate things. I will say that being on the national register could, for instance, let's say Dell Dot came through and wanted to add three more lanes next to the Independence Mall. There are some protections that would prevent that from happening if the Independence Mall was on the National Register. And so there are some protections and also some um, 
um, tax credits so that once it's on the National Register, um, the owners of the building can actually write off some expenses if they undergo any restoration or renovations or whatever. So there are some incentives um, for uh, places to be on the National Register. And, um, but I also just wanted to say, John, for you or whoever that was asking, I think one thing is really interesting. If you look at the really old National Register nominations that were done like in the seventies or whatever, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're like so simple. They're like, you know, like the house, you know, there's a date stone and the house looks old. I mean, it's, they're crazy simple. And nowadays you, you have to be a professional like Kate to write these things. You can't, like if I wanted to do my house, which we, we put our house on the National Register a few years ago, actually, Kate's um, colleague, Michael Emmons from Chad did it for us. And um, there's no way I could have done it myself. I, it just takes too much um, professional expertise in terms of the language to be used and what the National Park Service is looking for. And when you heard Kate's presentation and the depth of research that was done for this property, it's it's just, it's not the kind of thing that lay people can do anymore, where, whereas, you know, 30 years ago, you know, like the uh, little old ladies in tennis shoes used to go out and do it. So it's just interesting how it's evolved over the years, rightfully so, it's great, but um, it's not, it's a daunting thing if you own a historic property and you want to put it on the register, it's not the kind of thing you can do yourself. But you can contact Kate and get in line for maybe them to do it, and there are there are other professional historians around that also write nominations. So um, there are, you know, there are people that do it for a fee. And we definitely lament the missed opportunity of being born too, too late to write those two paragraph national <laughs> yeah. register nominations. But, um, there must have been a happy medium in there somewhere. I don't know, like the eighties maybe or something. Right. <laughs> I don't know, but. Any other questions out there? It's been a great, great talk and great conversation about a piece of Brandy 100 history. So oh, Jean has another question. Okay, Jean, uh, chime in. And I'm, uh, oops, yeah, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the time. So I'm gonna throw the question out, but there doesn't need to be an answer necessarily. Um, this is for Roseanne. So my primary role these days is an archivist. And so this is a historical society meeting and so, Roseanne, in 75 years, where will your father's materials be? I just leave you with that. <laughs> Maybe you need to answer it for us, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole separate conversation. Thanks but... to Kate. We hope that oh, it's I'm... like <laughs> I'm gonna, it will I'm, be, I'm, it will I'm, be I'm a subject. Gonna... Go I'm going to chime in. I'm going to chime in. You, the, the grandson of Emilio. The grandson. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to chime in. So I don't, I, I never met my grandfather. I, 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 I never knew him. I, I don't know anything about him. And, and what I know of my grandfather is what my aunt Rosanna tells me about him. But with that being said, I can definitely see he had a, a, a very specific delineation of colonial America, and he he had a very he had a very specific vision, and that vision was something that you know Rosanna has taken it to uh, uh, the very next level. That the mall is beautiful. And and it has an appeal that you don't see on Conquer Pike. There, there's nothing. There's nothing like it. It's it's and 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 Rosanna, you know as much as I do. There's there is nothing like it. It takes a village. Yeah. It Sorry, does. it takes a village. I I work every day at it, and I am. <laughs> 
extremely demanding and it's difficult. Uh, it really is because it's, it's a sensitive uh, property. It isn't, it isn't just bricks and mortar. Every, every it was built with residential materials. It, you know, I had to renovate it with, with basically that I, I can't just put metal in there. It's everything. Every facade is different. Every room is different. Every window is different. Every mm -hmm. opening is different. Everything you do there takes 10 times longer. If you could find someone to do it. Artisans we, we, to create this don't exist. We can't. We can't. We can't even change a light bulb. The, even even the light bulbs have to be a certain light bulb. You know, there has to be a certain lumens and a certain, you know, color and Kelvin. Every light bulb has to be. Uh, you know, there. The mall is very specific. There's there's a beauty to the mall that you don't see it. You know, shopping centers, shopping centers are, are soulless. There's nothing to a shopping center. This place is, it, it has, it has a, a beauty to it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Gene, Thank you. I might say in our first meeting last month, we did talk, you know, about things like that, the artifacts of Brandywine 100 and, and if, you know, I mean, I think there was a lot of interest in having a, a physical building for the Brandywine 100 Historical Site. It was only our first meeting, but we were already like jumping ahead to, we need a place where we can keep things and where people can donate things. And it, whether or not that ever happens, I don't know, it remains to be seen, but I guess, I don't know if the Historical Society of Delaware takes papers and things like that things but i think you're right to you know to get people thinking about what they will do with important materials like that exactly and um i i'll just throw out put in a little commercial i guess maybe for um an initiative that i've sort of envisioned and this part of it is we do have some other um 60s i guess kate again correct me if i'm wrong but 1960s architecture remnants of concord pike and what I'd love to do is uh, have a design overlay for the Concord Pike corridor and almost um, sort of honor that those 60s elements. We have the charcoal pit, we have the Independence Mall, we have a few other things up and down the pike. And, you know, maybe that could be, um, if someone was talking or asking earlier about, you know, why do we all stay here? What is it about this? I think there's a lot of nostalgia for those of us that grew up in the area and, you know, hung out on at various places on Concord Pike. So um, we're still here for some reason. And I think I think to kind of not recreate the 60s, but I think we could sort of honor what's still left of the 60s and 70s and you know, still allow economic development to continue. But it might be sort of what sets Concord Pike apart if we can um, create signage guidelines and that sort of thing, Rosanna, you mentioned. And one thing, you know, I'm trying to fight off the um, the electric messaging signage, um, right. but I've probably got a long way to go to to get something in code. But you know, wouldn't it be kind of cool if if Concord Pike was the, you know, it kind of had a a niche in terms of um, recognizing its past in that way. I agree. I I know we don't we don't we don't recognize the value of that. You know, you you we've been in meetings where I'm fighting with my neighbors, and they you know it it's like you know. Oh, you know, it's not about the money to me. It's about the heritage. It's about pride. It's about uh, beauty. I, I, the beauty of things is important to me. And um, thank you for all you're doing. Um, I think we do have a way to go, but I think this is a start. I really, really, really do think this is a start. The the Brandywine Hundred is a is important to the culture and the dynamic and the history of Wilmington. This is where we lived to the people that worked downtown, you know, we didn't live in Hocaston and Pike Creek so much. It was here. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, lot. and, and the, on the website, I mean, it's interesting that you have this new, you know, Facebook page, but the first picture on it, I assume is Falk road and, or Falk where Falk road, it's a blue ball barn, basically. It's, it's, right it's blue ball barn. Yeah. But could you write that on that picture? Because I had like, <laughs> I 
<laughs> you know, I, I mean, there's so many things we need to identify. I'm like, I yeah. think that's the blue ball tack, you know, because I named my, my ballroom, the blue ballroom. And people say, what's that mean? I'm like, do you realize that we were, you know, the route from bird in hand and intercourse Pennsylvania to Newport. And there was blue ball taverns all along the way. And you would have to drop that, that, that blue ball down because there were literate stagecoach drivers that needed to pick up people on the way. I mean, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to remember mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. But All right. Well, for, yeah. For thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Rosanna and Carson and Joe and everybody. Um, so, you know, stay tuned for future meetings, please, you know, come back and join us and we'll have Kate back again for, for more work that Chad's doing in the corridor and, uh, report on on more stuff throughout uh, you know not just the corridor but throughout Brady 100 so um next month Absolutely. I think we ha we have someone coming to talk to us about more about the logistics of how to form a historical society so it's probably going to be a little different talk but um thanks everyone I for being great. here tonight yeah thank That's you great, yeah. it was great okay. thank you yeah. awesome. thanks everybody good night, oh, right. awesome. good, night. <laughs> good night thanks Jay I'll talk to you Thursday or Friday I will email you tonight <laughs> Thanks. I'll talk to you in an hour. Ciao. Bye, Ken. Good Bye. night. See you, Carson. Ciao.